I just got done doing a live stream with Angelo Giuliano on the new Atlas. I will put a link to it in the video description below and also in a pinned comment, at the top of the comment section. I'm doing a condensed version of all of this background information regarding Taiwan, Taiwan as East Asia's Ukraine. And I'm doing this because essentially US foreign policy regarding Russia and this proxy war is fighting Russia through Ukraine with is identical, identical policy to what the US is doing to China through Taiwan. There are some very key differences, which I will mention right now, uh, just so you, you, you understand. And in case you already know this, you're not screaming at the top of your lungs at the screen. No, it's, it's not the same. Taiwan is totally different. Uh, first of all, Taiwan is not a country. This is the first thing uh, anyone in China will actually say when I compare Taiwan to Ukraine. They will say Ukraine is a country, Taiwan is not a country. They are absolutely right. Taiwan is not a country. No one in, on planet Earth right now, no, no nation, uh, no organization considers Taiwan to be a country, the island. It is not a country, not even Taiwan, not even the, the administration right now in Taipei, they do not recognize Taiwan as a country, do not see it as a country. The official name for the government of Taiwan is the Republic of China. There was a civil war. This side lost. They fled to Taiwan, which was part of China at the time. And they claimed that they were still the legitimate government of all of China, and they were just temporarily laid up in Taiwan. Of course, uh, the People's Republic of China, based in Beijing. This is the government recognized internationally as the sole legitimate government of China, all of China, including Taiwan. A small list of nations recognized the Republic of China in Taipei as the sole legitimate government of all of China. And that is it. No one recognizes the island of Taiwan as an actual country. Uh, and you can see how absolutely ridiculous it is to claim that the Republic of China based in Taipei is the sole legitimate government of all of China. It clearly is not. Even the United States, the UK and Australia, the AUKUS nations recognize Taiwan as part of China under the One China policy. I will show you this from the US State Department, their own official website, US relations with Taiwan. And it says, we oppose any unilateral changes to the status quo from either side. We do not support Taiwan independence. And we expect cross-strait differences to be resolved by peaceful means. Well, whatever the United States expects is irrelevant because the United States is on the other side of the ocean and it is none of their business. Just like nothing going on in North America is any of China's business. The U.S. State Department also says, consistent with the Taiwan Relations Act. Now, the U.S. has made an agreement with China over the One China policy. The Taiwan Relations Act is something the U.S. did internally. It has nothing to do with any agreement made with China. Actually, China would wholeheartedly disagree with this because it is an act that interferes in China's internal political affairs. Consistent with the Taiwan Relations Act, the United States makes available defense articles and services we're talking about weapons and training as necessary to enable Taiwan to maintain a sufficient self-defense capability and maintains our capacity to resist any resort to force or other forms of coercion that would jeopardize the security or the social or economic system of Taiwan. The United States does not recognize Taiwan as an independent country, and yet they are sending weapons to Taiwan in violation of Beijing's sovereignty over Taiwan. This alone, if you read this and understand what it is saying on the U.S. State Department's own official website, you can see how it is the United States that is at the heart of this growing crisis over Taiwan. The United States made an agreement with China, recognizing it as uh, one government over all of China, including Taiwan, and yet everything they do month to month, year to year, is in absolute violation of that agreement and in violation of China's sovereignty under international law and in violation of the UN Charter. 
for further evidence that Taiwan is not a country and that the United States does not recognize it as a country. It also says this on the U.S. State Department's official website. Through the American Institute in Taiwan, AIT, a non-governmental organization mandated by the Taiwan Relations Act, there is that act again, to carry out the United States' unofficial, unofficial relations with Taiwan. There are no official relations because it is not a country. The U.S. does not recognize it as a country. Our cooperation with Taiwan continues to expand. So the AIT exists only because Taiwan is not a country and there is no U.S. embassy there. And Taiwan does not have an embassy of its own in the United States because Taiwan recognizes that it itself is not a country. A lot of people will say, okay, Brian, maybe Taiwan is not a country. But can't the Taiwanese people decide that they don't want to be a part of China? Look at how horrible China is. And then they will rattle off a list of accusations given to them by the U.S. State Department. And they say if the people in the Donbas or people in Kherson and Zaporozhye or the people of Crimea, if they can all decide uh, that they want to depart from Ukraine and join the Russian Federation, why can't people in Taiwan vote to become an independent country? It's entirely different circumstances. These regions in Ukraine that voted to join the Russian Federation were escaping a U.S. installed client regime in Kiev. Ukraine's sovereignty was usurped by the United States. They placed an anti-Russian regime into power, which took demonstrable steps to persecute the Russian-speaking Ukrainians uh, from, from north to south, from east to west, including the people in these regions. They decided for their own best interests to leave a country that was usurped uh, by the United States and to join the Russian Federation for protection. The whole notion of Taiwanese independence is a product of the U.S. State Department, of U.S. foreign policy. It always has been. The only reason Taiwan exists in the way that it does today is because of constant, decades-long uh, military, political, economic, financial support from the United States. The current government, uh, the, the ruling party, the Democratic Progressive Party, exists solely because the United States created it and props it up financially and politically. It would not exist otherwise. The mass media organizations across Taiwan that are pushing pro-independence points of view are all funded by the United States government. They literally wouldn't exist without US sponsorship. From 1954, I told you there was a civil war. The Kuomintang lost. They fled to Taiwan. From 1954 to 1979, the US maintained thousands of military forces on Taiwan, the island of Taiwan. It was a virtual colony of the United States. The U.S. was militarily occupying part of Chinese territory. And the reason it ended in 1979 was because Washington made an agreement with Beijing, uh, the one China policy, essentially. They withdrew their troops. Uh, they, they, they had these uh, dialogues with China. You can find them on the U.S. State Department's official website. You can see the language and you can see how the U.S. admits that Taiwan is now part of China. And all of this was in exchange for China's support for the United States against the Soviet Union. At the end of the Cold War, the U.S. immediately started backtracking on this one China policy. So they used China. They were done using China. Now it was uh, they, they had divided and destroyed the Soviet Union. Now it is time to divide and destroy China. U.S. foreign policy is driven by a single, single purpose, to eliminate any peer or near peer competitor. They will not be tolerated. U.S. foreign policy is driven solely by this, this desire to destroy any type of serious competition, China being the most serious competition now. We just looked at the U.S. State Department's website. We see that they say it's they don't recognize Taiwan independence. They don't support Taiwan independence. So don't you think that it would be quite an extreme step if after agreeing to the one China policy and removing their troops from Taiwan because they recognize China's sovereignty over the island, that them sending U.S. troops back to Taiwan would be a major provocation, an act of war, essentially. Well, that is exactly what the United States did. This is an article from 2021. Secret group of U.S. military trainers has been in Taiwan for at least a year. 
The U.S. Army has, secret, is, has been secretly maintaining a small contingent of military trainers in Taiwan for at least a year, according to a new report, the latest sign of the rising stakes in U.S.-China rivalry. There is U.S. policy papers out there that suggest the U.S. continue quietly sending more and more troops to serve as a tripwire so that if, the, if uh, mainland China ever decided to truly and completely assert its sovereignty over the island, uh, they wouldn't be able to do so without jeopardizing, endangering, possibly killing U.S. troops. This would be the justification the U.S. would use to engage in warfare with the People's Republic of China. So all of this now laid out do do the people in taiwan get to vote on independence from from china is is that something that we can actually do and expect a reasonable rational result from the answer is no in order for any type of vote to take place and be meaningful in any way people have to be fully informed they have to be free of interference outside interference if I just told you that the Democratic Progressive Party, Tsai Ing-wen, who is the president of Taiwan currently, all of the media organizations in Taiwan are all pro-independence, pro-US, and they are putting these ideas into people's heads every single day, and alternative points of view are censored in Taiwan. So much for democracy. Can people make an informed decision? The answer is no. If they were to decide to go with independence from China, would that serve their best interests? This is not a question that requires a subjective answer. It must be an objective answer. And objectively, we can tell that Taiwan as an independent country would be created as a failed state and exist perpetually as a failed state. It would not serve the best interests of anyone there, even the most pro-american people living there would not serve their best interests why is this this is because while people will say the people's republic of china has never ruled over taiwan well the, the truth is they are represented by by the people's republic of china at international uh institutions and organizations like the un for example so yes they have they have been representing taiwan and they have a degree of political control uh, and say over Taiwan, whether Taiwan wants to admit that or not, but also economically. The rest of China has a, a huge impact on what goes on on Taiwan, the island of Taiwan. Let's look at this. This is the Atlas of Economic Complexity coming to us from Harvard University. This is imports. Where does Taiwan import from? Their largest import partner is the rest of China. And these aren't just... Um, plastic goods that they're picking up from the you know the supermarket or department store these are things like raw materials used for Taiwan's largest industries Semicon semiconductor production and the manufacturing of electronic components those, those raw materials come from the rest of China and without the rest of China sending these raw materials to Taiwan its largest industries would shut down you can get these materials from other countries, uh, but it's just like energy from Russia for the EU. They, yes, they can get energy from elsewhere, but it'll always be more expensive. Therefore, uh, their industrial capacity will always be at a disadvantage in terms of competing. And same goes for Taiwan. What about exports? Where does Taiwan export to? Uh, if you count China and Hong Kong together, and you should, because Hong Kong is part of China, it's almost half. It's almost half of their exports go to the rest of China. And if they were to declare themselves independent and they lost access to the rest of China's economy, there is absolutely no way for them to replace that. Uh, so would that be in the best interest of the people of Taiwan? Clearly not. There are articles like this from the BBC, just to give you a little example. The farmers caught up in Taiwan's tensions with China. So there are farmers who export their products to the rest of China. And when the government, the client regime that the US has installed into power in Taipei, when they begin provoking Beijing, 
pursuing separatism, essentially. And by the way, there are laws in every single country prohibiting separatism. This isn't something that should just be humored. No country would humor it. Beijing does not humor this. They will put restrictions on Taiwan to, to, to punish them, to rein them in. And so the, they're already suffering because of this. It's maybe to give them a, a preview of what would come if they were to decide to go fully independent. Now, when I say fully independent, I don't mean actually independent. A lot of people say, Brian, don't, don't you want the Taiwanese to, to have self-determination, to have independence, to have freedom to decide their fate for themselves? That is impossible because they, they are fully dependent on the United States. Taiwan, as it is right now, politically, is entirely dependent on the United States. Economically, it's entirely dependent on, on China. Everything in actual reality is dependent on China. Everything in the political realm it is dependent on the United States. That is why the rhetoric coming out of Taipei is so dangerous. I want to show you just how entwined the current political leadership in Taiwan is with the United States. This is called the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, and it is essentially the U.S., funded National Endowment for Democracy subsidiary for Taiwan. Uh, if you search National Endowment for Democracy and Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, you will get results like this. Taiwan Foundation for Democracy Taipei, remarks by Carl Gershman, president of the National Endowment for Democracy. Now these remarks by Carl Gershman, the, the former president of the US NED, he talks about how the NED and the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy work together and they will promote democracy across Asia together. Democracy is a process of self-determination. So if the United States is involving itself in the process of self-determination anywhere in Asia, they are not actually promoting democracy, they are undermining it. That is what the NED actually is. It is a regime change organization. It uses democracy promotion as camouflage because they couldn't just openly say they are blatantly meddling in the internal political affairs of other nations. Now, I want to give you a, an example of this relationship between the NED and the, the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. There, there are so many. I don't even know where to begin. So I'm just going to show you this one article from Taipei Times. U.S. group pressures Ma on TFD shuffle. So what do they say in this article? This article is from 2009. So this has been going on for a long time. The U.S. has been undermining ta Taiwan political independence for a very long time. Carl Gershman, president of the Washington-based National Endowment for Democracy, has written to President Ma Ying-jeou, uh, calling on him not to interfere with the structure and policies of the highly respected Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. So there's an institution in Taiwan, and you have an American overseeing an organization funded by the U.S. government, telling the president of Taiwan what he can and cannot do at the institutions located within the boundaries of what is considered Taiwan. It has been widely reported that the Ma administration intends to make major changes to the foundation's governing board and to stop it from offering financial support to pro-democracy movements in China, Tibet, and Cuba. And, uh, well, actually, to stop it from meddling <laughs> everywhere. It's where it's not supposed to, where it is uh, not promoting democracy, but political interference. So it just gives you an idea of what the, the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy is. This is an extension of the NED. And when someone attempted, the president of Taiwan attempted to reshape it to serve the interests of Taiwan, the United States intervened and told them not to. And eventually the U.S. was so unsatisfied with President Ma that they installed Tsai Ing-wen in his place. Uh, and Tsai Ing-wen followed what was called the Sunflower Movement. Uh, this is from Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. The activist legacy of Taiwan's sunflower movement. They were opposing closer economic cooperation with the rest of China, which clearly does not serve the best interests of the people in Taiwan. And the economy has suffered ever since they successfully uh, stopped this and, and began rolling back economic cooperation with the rest of China. The, the 
gov the economy of Taiwan has been spiraling downward ever since. It was also to reshape the political system, take power from the Kuomintang ruling government, and give it to the Democratic Progressive Party, uh, led by Tsai Ing-wen. Now, who is Tsai Ing-wen? Who is she? Uh, she is someone who, before becoming president, was reporting regularly to the U.S. government. This is a this is a politician in Taiwan. We're supposed to believe it's some sort of independent entity, and yet she was reporting regularly to the United States regarding issues that were none of the United States' business. And we have many, actually, many WikiLeak cables detailing her discussions with the U.S. government at the AIT. The fake embassy in Taiwan because it's not a real country. There is no real embassy there. So here's one. Director's farewell call on DPP Chair Tsai Ing-wen. In this cable, it says, President Ma plans to open Taiwan up to China as much as possible, Tsai said, with relaxation of restrictions on investment in sensitive sectors such as telecommunications, transportation, air, and seaports coming within a month. China, Xiao, uh, suggested is pushing Taiwan toward unification. The Chinese are coming, Tsai warned, calling the growing danger the cost of deepening ties with the PRC. With the Taiwan economy in difficult straits, she added people do not have a choice and will work with anyone who can pay them. What, what she's saying is the, the, the economy in Taiwan is in bad shape because they are attempting to be an independent country when it makes no sense uh, economically and that people are drawn to reun reunify with the rest of China because it would be in their best interest economically. Everybody would be prospering. Uh, the, the economy would shift back in a positive direction. And so Tsai Ing-wen wants to stop this because she represents Washington. Washington doesn't care about Taiwan's economy. They care about using Taiwan as an unsinkable aircraft carrier against the rest of China. So does Tsai Ing-wen strike you as a real leader, um, the, a leader of the people of Taiwan, a representative of their best interests, or does she strike you as Taiwan's Vladimir Zelensky? Now, uh, this is all background information, and now I want to talk about something that has been in the news more recently. We're, we're all aware of the semiconductor industry in Taiwan, how the U.S. is after it, uh, how the U.S. is actually trying to dominate semiconductor production globally. Uh, and not just by taking control over the industry in Taiwan, but also in Japan and South Korea. So here is a Financial Times article right here. U.S. struggles to mobilize its East Asian Chip 4 alliance. And I called this uh, actually Chip 3 piracy in the live stream because that is exactly what it is. It is doing to the chip industry and Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea what the U.S. has done to the European Union regarding Russian energy exports. It is uh, telling an entire region of the planet to fall on its own sword to try to hurt Russia. And also, as an alternative, they're going to offer American liquid natural gas to Europe as an alternative, knowing full well that it'll destroy their competitive edge indefinitely. Deindustrialization. This is what uh, this is the word we keep hearing. This is going to do the exact same thing to chip production. This is what the Financial Times says. Fear of Chinese retaliation and regional tensions are hampering U.S. efforts to rally its East Asian allies behind a proposed semiconductor supply chain alliance. The Chip 4 initiative is part of a U.S. strategy to strengthen its access to vital chips and weaken Chinese involvement on trade and national security grounds. Now, fears of Chinese retaliation and regional tensions. This is extremely important. You may or may not know this, but virtually every nation in Asia counts China as their largest trade partner. Even countries like Japan, who you might not think were working so closely economically with China, but are actually. Same for South Korea. These are two nations that host tens of thousands of US troops, by the way. So regional tensions, not, not just tensions with China, that will definitely hurt a nation like Japan or South Korea, but regional tensions in general hurt all of Asia, not just China. It's very important to keep that in mind. 
It is supposed to comprise the US, South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, offering a forum for governments and companies to discuss and coordinate policies on supply chain security, workforce development, R&D, and, subs and subsidies. But a year after the plans were first drawn up, the four countries have yet to finalize plans even for a preliminary meeting. Concerns include China's likely response, hesitation over including Taiwan, and an intergovernmental forum because, as I explained in the beginning of this video, Taiwan is not a country, and long-standing tensions between South Korea and Japan. Because we're always told that China is this big bully tormenting everyone in Asia, and everyone in Asia otherwise would be enjoying peace and prosperity. When in reality, there are tensions all throughout Asia between all of these different countries. They prioritize peace and prosperity, regional stability over uh, jeopardizing stability over these differences that they have. That, that can go for a multitude of issues. The South China Sea, for example, it is not just all of these nations uh, making claims against China, they all make claims against each other also. And it can get very heated, but at the end of the day, they always choose stability, prosperity, economic cooperation over conflict. That is, that's what inhibits it from becoming a conflict. The U.S. is injecting itself into this situation and attempting to escalate it into a conflict. So what is the U.S. Uh, through its Chip 4 alliance, what is it attempting to do? Well, first, let's Let's read uh, how this concludes. The Financial Times article concludes. Nazak Nika Qatar, a former senior US economic security official, now a Washington law firm, now at Washington law firm Wiley Rain, said the slow progress of the initiative demonstrated a multilateral approach only works if everybody has the same desire to move at the exact same time. Uh, so, the United States most certainly wants to isolate China and the US does not want to cooperate with China. They want nothing to do with China except to encircle it, contain it, divide it, destroy it. Is that what South Korea, Japan, or the island of Taiwan, is that what they want? And the answer is no, it doesn't benefit them. As I have showed you, their largest trade partner, their whole economy essentially is going to be impacted if they do that. So they don't want to do this. This is something the U.S. is roping them into. South Korea is not as advanced as the U.S. or Japan on the China issue. They are worried about North Korea, their proximity to China, and so on, she said. We also can't expect Taiwan to self-regulate trade with China because so many of the raw materials they use to make chips come from China. I just showed you that. So the notion that you could get Taiwan and South Korea especially to move in lockstep with us on this is absurd. It is absurd. You're asking nations to gut a key industry, harm themselves economically, not just in terms of semiconductors, but in terms of everything. Because if you're deliberately trying to destroy China's economy by doing this, they are going to retaliate and it's going to impact your economy as well. They don't want anything to do with this. The U.S., if you look at the four chip alliance, one of these alliance members is on the other side of an ocean. Everyone else is in the region alongside China. So the US is more than happy to stir things when it's not going to be them uh, hit by the, the fallout. The US is completely unable to compete with China. They cannot compete with China. China surpassing the United States is inevitable. China has a population larger than the G7 combined. Not just larger than the U.S., but larger than the G7 combined. They have world-class infrastructure. They have the largest high-speed rail network on Earth. The U.S. doesn't have a single kilometer of high-speed rail. They have a massive industrial base, you, something you have to see to believe. It is so enormous, and, and we all know this because so many things are made in China. They also have a massive and ever-improving educational system. They graduate millions more every single year than the United States in fields like science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the STEM fields. Even in terms of PhD graduates, China graduates thousands more than the US, and by 2025, they will be graduating two times more than the United States. This, these are human resources that are going to directly impact high-tech industries like semiconductor production. They are going to figure it out no matter what type of restrictions you try to place on them. 
they will figure it out. It is only a matter of time. And when they do, they will surpass the U.S. And then as they surpass the U.S., the gap between them and the U.S. will increase year to year. This is a fact. As a matter of fact, even though, and if you read the Financial Times article, they will tell you that it's already hard to do business with China in regards to semiconductors because the U.S. has been incrementally over the years trying to sabotage and destroy China's semiconductor industry and trying to deny them access to technology from around the world. But we keep seeing in headlines China making smaller and smaller semiconductors despite these setbacks. So they, they are circumventing it and they will because of the, the army of uh, STEM graduates that are now going into industry and boosting their industry. What is an industry but people involved in it? The United States is trying to do to China what they're trying to do to, to Russia, and it is a, it's an exercise in futility. But the United States, the current interests running the United States, don't know what else to do. These are people who could never accept operating as a nation among other nations in a multipolar world. They cannot, they will not. For generations, the U.S. and before the U.S., uh, the, the British have dominated the planet and they want to continue doing it and they will do just about anything to, to make that happen. So we have to be very careful. We are watching Ukraine be dis dismembered politically, militarily, socially, and they are setting Taiwan up for the same fate. So that is a little bit of background information regarding Taiwan and how it connects not just to current events, but also the situation in Ukraine. I hope people keep an open mind to this. I have a lot of people in the comment section saying, Brian, you're right about everything about Ukraine, but you're totally wrong about Taiwan. Is it because I'm wrong or is it because I'm saying something you don't want to, to be right or to be true? You have to ask yourself that, honestly. You see the sources that I'm citing. Uh, it's not Chinese state media. It is the U.S. State Department's official website. It is Western media, just like I do for my research and analysis on Ukraine. Uh, so it, the truth can make people feel uncomfortable. Believe me, I know. I, I joined the Marine Corps when I was 17. I believed wholeheartedly in what the United States was doing around the world. Uh, but... As I saw things with my own eyes and I started doing my own research and I committed myself to following the truth, no matter how uncomfortable, uh, that's exact. That's eventually what led me to what I'm doing right now. So uh, if that's the 180 that I can do, surely you could uh, do a little extra research and, and ask yourself personally, like, why am I repeating talking points from the U.S. State Department on China when I'm uh, wholeheartedly opposed to talking points from the U.S. State Department regarding Ukraine. That is a problem that you need to resolve. It is not just a coincidence that you just so happen to believe the U.S. State Department in regards to China is because they have tricked you. And if you would like to see my research about a specific to topic regarding China, go to my channel on YouTube, click on the videos tab and hit the search function and type in any topic that you want to know uh, about and see my research regarding. So say Tibet, just type in Tibet and I will show you. And don't just listen to what I say, go to the video description below and look at my sources. Again, these are all primary sources. This is not Chinese state media. It's not some blogger, some random blogger writing second or third hand information about China. It is the US State Department. It is Voice of America funded by the US government. It is the organizations funded by the government masquerading as uh, Tibet human rights organization. So please uh, check that out. I have done hundreds of videos and many of them before the situation in Ukraine started were about Asia and also China. If this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing to my channel. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. Uh, check in the video description below for other places you can find and follow my work. In addition to YouTube, I am on Telegram. I update that several times a day. All of my YouTube videos are backed up on Odyssey and Rumble. They'll show up there eventually. Subtitles will also show up eventually in my YouTube videos. I have no control over that. It's auto-generated. In the video description below, I also list all of my sources. I, I take a lot of extra time to take all of my sources and list them so that you can see where I'm getting my information from. 
So please check that out. If you doubt anything that I'm saying, look at my sources, read it for yourself. In, in the video description, there are also ways you can help support my work. I don't monetize my YouTube channel in any way. No super chats during live streams. Uh, no, no monetization. If there's a, an ad that ever pops up, skip it because it's not helping me at all. If you do want to help me out, please use buy me a coffee, Patreon, or PayPal and PayPal as a last resort because they are getting political and restricting access uh, to their platform based on political ideology. To everyone who has been helping uh, support my work month to month through one-time donations or even just by sharing my my work or tuning into a live stream, uh, leaving a friendly comment, thank you so much. I could not do this work without that support. My, my work is entirely supported by my audience. Uh, so again, thank you so much. And as always, thank you for watching.